Chapter 40, The General's Visitor, 2004, January 2005. There were days when Detective Reyes felt like one team was five fucking steps behind the NF. Lacking resources for a wiretap, the team agreed the only way to find out who these guys Baby Joker, BJ, and Tigre answered to was to tail them. The problem was none of the one team members had ever done out of county rolling surveillance. They started with the tracking device under BJ's vehicle. Very quickly, they discovered that because he lived in remote, hilly country, his signal was almost impossible to pick up. They never knew when he left home until it was too late. Then they tried to track Tigre. From working informants, now they had a name for him. Antonio Benigo Rubacaba III, also known as Tony the Tiger. He was no kid. If anything, he looked like a veteran of many wars. Tigre stood out in the crowd, his face angular, planned, as if sculpted with a wide chisel. A tiny north star was tattooed near the corner of his left eye. An indecipherable script decorated his neck. But you always went back to the eyes. They were deep set, heavy lidded like a poet's. And they were striking kind of eyes that could either seduce or terrorize. The team believed Tigre was second in command of Baby Joker. Yet his face and those eyes said he was far from benign. Tigre drove a black Monte Carlo, a replica of the ride driven by Denzel Washington in the film Training Day, with personalized plates that read 79 Monte, making it simple enough for the officers to pull him over. He had some pissy little warrant and it was enough to hold him for a minute. While he was detained, the cops crawled under the Monte and placed a magnetized tracker on the underside of the chassis. They sent Tigre on his way. Unlike BJ, he lived in town, so his signals would be easier to trace. The tracker worked beautifully, until he found it. Tigre took the strange little device to a regiment commander in San Jose and showed it to him. That was me. (laughs) Yeah, the boss said, not surprised. That's the same thing I found on my car. That was me. You guys already heard that story before. Under the boss's tutelage, Tigre soon became a master of anti-surveillance. Yeah, I taught him well. At least everything that I knew because I was having the same problem when me and my second in command found tracking devices under our vehicles. Early one morning, Reyes joined other team members in a half dozen unmarked units. They'd gotten a tip that Tigre was heading to San Jose and they hoped to catch him meeting with a boss or two. Tigre rolled out along Green Valley Road. The surveillance cars held back and the officers were pleased to see no sign that their target had become suspicious. Tigre pulled onto Highway 1 and abruptly floored it to 70 miles an hour, jamming in the number 3 lane, rolling over to the number 1 lane, then quickly rolling back to the right and taking the next exit. It was a remote country road with no traffic. Tigre pulled off and slowed crawling up a hill at 30 miles an hour. They were screwed. Reyes scrambled to dodge Tigre's view while a few of the unmarked vehicles had to pass their target and pray he didn't recognize them. Others who had been holding far back on Highway 1 were stunned by what they saw as they approached the exit. Tigre had driven onto an overpass and parked. He was out of the car and staring down at the highway, scouring the lanes to see who was following. That's how good he was, Reyes thought, amazing. This kind of work was new to Reyes. Only the FBI guys like Roland Martinez and Manny Alvarez were used to this stuff. The one team's self-training was by necessity fast and furious. They learned to talk on secure DOJ and FBI radio frequencies, and they got used to handling small details such as alerting local cops when they rolled into their towns. They honed surveillance techniques on the fly using trial and error. Reyes knew there were schools for these skills, but who had the time? The team finally felt they were primed to outwit Tigre. Reyes and more than a dozen fellow officers trailed him undetected for almost three hours all the way to Sacramento and they felt a great flush of pride in doing so. They kept their distance as they watched him meet a guy at the hotel in West Sacramento. They stayed in the area for two days, taking turns sleeping and eating and following the other guy. Once they were sure of the other man's ID, they went back home and gleaned enough from their informants to put the picture together. It was unbelievable. 
But the Watsonville Regiment was making so much money that BJ had been put in charge of Sacramento too. The guy Tigre met was one of the Sacks Regiment's liaisons. At one point, the cops pulled Tigre over just to see what was what. Their hearts sank when he told them he was on their tails the whole damn trip to Sacra. They forged ahead. The trail led them to a tattoo shop in Hollister that BJ ran as an NF front. They added more names to their files. Danger from Watsonville, Weasel from Castroville, Bros and Carnales from San Jose. The familia that rose from Black Widow's ashes was rapidly expanding. The one officers were created with their meager resources. Vowing not to repeat the mistakes of Black Widow, the team members shared intelligence with police in nearby communities, and the locals responded in kind. They recruited all the informants they could. The one war room now included the beginnings of a family tree. Bubba was on the list. Sources said he was back on the street and conferring often with Baby Joker. Bubba might be a crew boss, possibly over BJ, but under that old schooler Pocky. They caught a break when they found a link between two of their targets in the form of a homegirl who shared a bed with the regimental commander Baby Joker. And she was also a cousin of Tigre, BJ's right hand man. Her name was Rosa. I mentioned her to you guys in the Watsonville hitters. This is the one that had an affair with the, with the individual they took out to Hecker Pass. I can't remember his name right now. The cops tailed the girl and she was making regular trips to Oakland. On a hunch, Reyes called the Alameda County Jail in Oakland and chatted up a deputy. They hit it off right away. Yeah, we got all the hierarchy all the way up. The individual I was thinking, his name was Spooky. That was the one they took to Hecker Pass. Yeah, we got all the hierarchy of the NF up here, the officer told him. The jail had a section for federal holding cells and everyone who was anyone was still in them. The generals and captains had all cop guilty pleas, but they still hadn't been sentenced. It turned out sentencing might take months, maybe a year or more. Wow, so that's where Rose is going, Reyes thought. He shared the information with his team. The next time officers saw Rosa driving out, they pulled her over, hoping to strike up a conversation. She didn't feel like chatting, but she had an old warrant, and that meant they could search her vehicle. They found blank money orders in $500 denominations. In her purse, they found one made to an influential carna in Pelican Bay. This was an important discovery. The find meant Pelican Bay might still be serving as headquarters for the NF, though the gang's entire top brass was housed in Oakland. They found a prison kite addressed to BJ, complaining that he was ignoring messages from Tibbs, one of the three generals in Alameda County Jail. This piqued the one officer's interest. Was Rosa connected to both Oakland and Pelican Bay? The most fascinating find, though, was her digital camera. On it were pictures of a man's chin and shoulders, his hands holding what looked like a letter-sized sheet of paper. The cops recognized the man's shirt as an inmate's uniform, similar to those worn at the jail in Oakland. They thought the inmate might be that General Tibbs. He must have secreted the paper in his mouth or somewhere else and spread it out against the glass during the visit. When the detective blew up the photo, they found the note contained a message about NF business. The discovery was disturbing and important. Rosa certainly linked Pelican Bay to Oakland, which meant Black Widow's goal a severing the generals from the bay and the streets wasn't working as well as the government had hoped. The leaders still control California. Reyes called his deputy friend in Oakland. This is what's going on, he said. You've got a female that's coming in, somehow hiding this digital camera. The next time Rosa showed up for a visit, two female deputies were stationed at the metal detector. When it beeped, Rosa told the officers, oh, it must be her underwires, just as she always said. This time, the deputies conducted a thorough search and found a tiny camera tucked into Rosa's cleavage. We're getting pretty good at this, Reyes thought, and he felt proud of his team. Soon, he was in the Oakland jail, peering down at the visiting area from the tier above. He watched while a couple of females took seats, picked up telephone handsets, and greeted two generals. With Rosa banned from the jail, Reyes had taken to follow two other women who had made the trek to North Oakland. Carol, known to the homeboys as Old Girl, came from Castroville and was visiting Pinky Hernandez, one of the gang's three generals. Carol had apparently become Miss Pinky. 
The second visitor was a girl from Salinas named Crystal. She visited the general called Tibbs. Crystal was pretty in a bouncy way and quick to smile. She must have been all of 18 or 19 and she looked like a baby next to the wizened old Tibbs. Hell, she looked like a baby compared to Reyes who was barely in his 30s. From the tier above, Reyes couldn't make out their words but it was easy to see that Tibbs was upset. The man gestured angrily and yelled into the phone. It made Reyes crazy that he couldn't listen in. Unlike Pelican Bay, the jail had no capability to record or let cops eavesdrop on the inmates during visits. Reyes and his colleagues had to monitor the visiting logs, follow the women afterward, or watch in hope they could decipher the general's hand signs, and so he was watching. He wondered about Crystal's role. Was she Tibbs' daughter? His sister? Old girl, the name Carol, on the other hand, clearly seemed to be some kind of boss, practically one of the guys. On one occasion, Reyes had followed her out and watched from two blocks away. After visiting Pinky, she met with a couple of Norteño men under a bridge, and although they were big guys, old girl pushed a finger into their chest as if she were giving the orders. They handed her envelopes. Interesting, Reyes told himself. He figured the envelopes contained taxes from the streets, and now he realized those taxes weren't just channeled to NF Banks in Pelican Bay by Rosa. He decided they were also flowing the Oakland boys through Old Girl. Rather than crushing the NF's base of operations, Black Widow had inadvertently created two sets of headquarters. It was like watching these mutant cells divide on TV science shows. As he peered down the tier at Tibbs and Crystal, Reyes tried to decipher the gestures, but couldn't figure out what was wrong. Crystal's visits with Tibbs had started out friendly, then warm, and now, for unknown reasons, the general was unhappy and didn't hold back in venting his anger to his young visitor. Tibbs and his four remaining colleagues had yet to be sentenced. At the last minute, the hearing for the final five was postponed because some lawyer figured out that the generals and captains couldn't be turned over to the feds unless Governor Schwarzenegger signed clemency orders dropping their California life sentences. Apparently, no one in Mueller's office had thought of this. A few district attorneys found out about the possible clemency and were not happy about losing their hard-worn convictions against career criminals like Tibbs, Pinky, and Corny. The DA sent orders to the governor protesting any clemency on the grounds that you never knew when the feds might cut some weird deal and set these guys loose. Stranger things had happened. It was crazy. Suddenly, everything Mueller and the FBI had toiled over the years was now in jeopardy. If the governor refused to grant clemency, the federal sentences would be mute and the generals would have to return to Pelican Bay. On the other hand, the California DAs had good cause not to trust the Fed system. They dug their heels in. Schwarzenegger spent months pondering this weighty decision while the state's lawyers scrambled to find a compromise. For the generals, the delay meant more time to reestablish their hold on California. There were rumblings that street regiments had turned their allegiance to several up-and-comers in Pelican Bay, including that loose cannon Matt Rocha from Salinas. The men in Oakland, though, were still the generals, and they felt the streets needed to be reminded of this. Tibbs joined in this effort while he waited for the governor's decision, and he put his new bride to work. Her husband wasn't with her for the event, and of course, the child wasn't his anyway. He was born before she met him, and besides, Tibbs had always told her she should go with other guys. He understood she had needs that a prisoner doing life just couldn't satisfy. He was a kind man in that way. Tibbs had just celebrated his birthday in the Oakland jail. He was 57. Crystal, who had barely turned 20, had not been there with them. She was trying to focus more on her son and frankly was a bit worn out from the constant errands her husband asked of her. Marriage was supposed to be about love not just delivering messages and money to homeboys and generals. Not that she was complaining. She'd always been all about taking care of her man. That's the kind of girl she was. But for one brief evening, it was nice to laugh and play with her little boy and forget the work. Her baby's daddy was coming home from prison in a week. She imagined them together again, becoming a family, a real family, and her hopes for herself and her son grew. The relationship with Tibbs was a courtship through letters. Her friend Bubba had introduced them and encouraged her to write. Tibbs was more than twice her age, but Crystal, who was 19 when she met him, liked the man and visited regularly. 
Tibbs kept his still black hair a bit longer than some of the other generals, which made him look like he was less of a gangster and more like a friendly uncle. His charming attributes included a huge smile and laughter that came easily. Their relationship quickly turned to a romance conducted through a half inch of glass. Her pastor had tried his best to talk her out of it, but Crystal was determined to be with Tibbs. She announced the marriage to friends and family. She changed her last name to his on her driver's license. It upset her father and her pastor, but Crystal was happy and perhaps a bit in love. And she needed the money. She told her family that Tibbs could bring them all financial security, that she and her baby would at last be taken care of. Yet for the past few weeks, she'd been on edge. Some homegirl kept calling her and leaving nasty messages. Another girl was on her case because Crystal used to date Bubba. Even her friend, old girl, was jealous lately because Crystal had dated her current love interest. People just kept on hating. The Chuck E. Cheese's dinner wound down and responsibility crept in. It was turning dark when she took a call. It was her old friend Bubba. Watch my son real quick, she asked her kid sister. She gave her mom and sister a ride home, kissed her sweet baby boy goodnight, and promised she'd be right back. When she hadn't returned after a few hours, her mother called herself. Crystal answered with Mexican music playing in the background, which her mother thought was a little odd. That wasn't Crystal's thing. Crystal told her mom she'd be home soon and not to worry. She had to go to school the next day and wouldn't stay out late.